this morning. For those of you who desire to um, support the ministry in whatever way, or I want to say thank you for those of you who have supported the ministry um, on last month and even this month. Uh, but if you want to know how to support the ministry, you can go to the website, which is oasisspiritualcenter.com, go to the giving tab, or if you want to do it in a more expeditious way, you can just go to use your Cash App or Zelle and put in the number 708-368-1076. All right, I want to thank you all. Uh, we'll come back to that uh, um, towards the end of today's presentation to make sure those who want to um, or who will find value you may not see any value in it, but perhaps by the end of this morning's presentation, you will see, hey, there's some value in this, and I want to support this ministry. So this morning, my message is entitled, you were not an afterthought. Actually, I reframed it. It is you are not an afterthought um, source. Now, I want so many of you to know that many individuals that I engage on a daily basis from my coaching practice to just encountering people on the street, I see the limiting factor that they're dealing with is a sin consciousness, is a um, belief system that is erroneous, um, not realizing that you are, we are sources crowning glory. For the word tells us, what is man? that thou considered him and made him a little lower than angels. Now, the only thing that makes us a little lower than angels are the vibrational frequency that we have that gives us a density or to uh, what we call our human bodies. Other than that, we are made of the God stuff. And hopefully this morning, by the end of this message, you will understand that you're not an afterthought, that you were deliberately and intentionally created for a time such as this. Again, I want to welcome all of you. If you are in the Zoom room this morning and if the volume is not loud enough uh, or I'm going too fast this morning, please take liberty and type it in into this, the chat and I will adjust accordingly. Again, I welcome everyone to this morning's presentation. You are not an afterthought. Now, what are we going to cover? Uh, we're going to cover uh, uh, quite a bit of ground this morning in the next 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, even though there appears to be a lot here, I'm just going to touch on something on, the, on something inside of each of these. Uh, and then on Tuesday night, we have Transformation Tuesday. Inside of Transformation Tuesday, we go into a deeper dive of what has been shared in the previous Sunday. Reason why I do that, because for many people who tune in on Sunday, it's just about information. It's just about acquiring knowledge. But true transformation takes place not just by inspiration or being inspired, but transformation is the, the taking of the information and you take it to application. And so during the week, we deal with application on Tuesday nights. I hope that I can see you on this upcoming Tuesday night. So what we're gonna cover, we're gonna cover, uh, which I'm into sort of the introduction of today's lesson. Uh, we're gonna talk about creation. We're gonna touch our base on the divine reflections and aspiration, uh, a covenant of intimacy, covenant and intimacy. Christ consciousness as it relates to unity, transformation conscious alignment, that is transformation coming through the heaven, uh, a consciousness um, that aligns you with or uh, keeps you connected to source. We're going to look at the ancient echoes of divine oneness. Now, I'm going to introduce for some of you all, you should have gotten an email earlier this week where I laid out the Memphite theology. And so we're going to just cover that a little bit this morning. And I want to really end up with this last point, the implications of embracing a creator's identity, uh, 
a God complex. I know in the past when you hear somebody say someone has a God complex, um, that was looked at as they had a psychological issue there um, that they needed to be put in the in the mental institution. Um, but there's more to that than what the world has defined it as. And then we're going to wrap up this morning. So let's um, jump right on in this morning. Um, if you have a question and you're in the Zoom room, you can feel free to raise your hand and I will um, um, address it either at the next point after I complete my thought or we're towards the end. So I want to make sure that if you have questions, comments, please feel free to drop them in the feed. And if you're on our YouTube channel this morning, hit that like button and don't forget to um, also to join if you're not part of that New Thought community. Okay, let's start with if you are God. So we have so many people who run around talking about how they are God, but when you look at their lives, individuals who are hearing them say this kind of stuff, of say, if you are God, I don't want to have anything to do with that God because so many people are broke, busted, disgusted, uh, sickness and disease, weakness, um, not having, they're just wandering generalities. But I want you to con begin to consider the concept of divine oneness. We see that the scriptures tell us, for even Jesus in the New Testament says, does not your scripture say that you are God? So we want to understand the concept of you are God is central to you expressing through life with mastery and not frustration. There are some implications that come with um, when you take on this mindset, um, when you take on the walking as a divine spiritual being, your spirit becomes part or aligns with the divine spirit. I often tell, those who follow me, that man's a spirit that possesses a soul, and the soul is defined as the mental capacity, your reasoning faculty, your personality. So man is a spirit that possesses a soul, and it, it lives in a body, and there's more to it. There's four dimensions to you. Man is mental, that's the soulless realm. Man has emotions. And man is physical, but most importantly, man is spiritual. The problem is the majority of us are either ruled by our mental selves, emotional selves, or our physical selves. And if you're ruled by any three of those, you are considered a carnal minded person because your spirit is being grieved. But when you align yourself properly, um, as a divine spiritual being that possesses a soul and lives in a body and they all work in tandem, you will find yourself having complete mastery. So your spirit is part of the divine spirit. When we look in Genesis chapter one, we see the, the forming or the creation of man. It says, let us, and we're going to go into that. And then chapter two of Genesis, we see the forming of man where he goes from just being a spiritual idea to actually being a materialized being. And then in that same chapter, we see that source does something that it had not done with any of the other part of his creation. It breathed into man and man became a living soul or a divine spiritual being able to operate inside of this ecosystem, not just as a mere human being, but as a divine spiritual being. So no beginning or ending. Like source, we are created in its image after its likeness. And the essence of source is source is a spirit. And a spirit does not have gender, uh, does not have a, uh, a body does not have hands. It is it, it's a it's a entity. It's 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 energy, and so we in the beginning was with source, and that's difficult to embrace because we have been given a creation story. When we look at the Abrahamic creation story that you find in Genesis, um, this story is is dictated from a very patriarchal, uh, from a very um, second nature 
aspect of who he is. That is from a from the perspective of being what I would like to call in the fallen state or the unenlightened state. Um, but we, we need to move away from that and go back to the beginning. So for too many of us, the beginning starts with the um, the story of creation as given to us by the Abraham traditions in this in this case through Christianity and through the um, the story given to us through Christianity about Moses giving us the first five books of the Torah, one of which is being Genesis. And that story as is given given to us from the Hebraic or the um, Israelite perspective is um, it is it, plagiarized to say the least, meaning that reason why I say it's plagiarized because they don't tell you where this story comes from. When we talk about the beginning, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, we're talking about at least 60,000 years. For those who can't fathom that man is more than um, 4,000, 6,000, 8,000, 10,000 years. We can go back 60,000 years and we find ourselves in the um, ancient wisdom of the Africans as they give us their creation stories, which we're going to kind of look at. So I want us to begin to uh, identify with the, the concept that we are God. Now, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, we see the biblical narrative, narrative begins with um, is powerfully presented to us with the creation of man uh, where source or God articulates, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. This declaration is not merely about physical resemblance, but imp implies a deeper spiritual connectivity and shared attributes such as creativity, reason, and the capacity for relationship. When we look at this, this concept sets a foundational understanding of humanity's divine heritage and intrinsic value, positioning each of us as unique reflectors of sources character and um, co-participants in the unfolding drama. Now, the us, who is the us? I know that traditional Christianity gives us a trinity that says God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit was the us. But I want to say that we need to expand beyond this story. And we're going to realize that if we're talking about source, and source being a spirit, and source creates us in its image after its likeness, and we being spirits, and that spirits have no beginning or ending, that we were there in the beginning. Now, I want you to kind of make some space, lay that over there, because that's uh, kind of an imposing thought. Because to think that you were in the beginning says clearly that you were intentionally and deliberately created. You're not an afterthought. My question is, where did you get the belief that you weren't in the beginning? Where did you get it? We all got that belief from well-intending individuals, maybe our Sunday school teachers, our parents, uh, people who influenced us, the culture that we walked inside of, that gave us the um, creation story as you find it in, in the traditional Holy Bible, the Holy Bible, King James Version, when we say the beginning, it could not possibly mean that you were there. Why? Because you've been told that you were um, uh, formed in sin, shaped in iniquity, that you, um, that there's nothing good inside of mankind. And so we cannot possibly fathom that we being man created in his image after his likeness was actually there in the beginning, but we were. And we're going to go deeper into that um, this Tuesday night, but I want you to begin to think about what is the implications of the idea that you were there 
in the beginning, that you were part of the let us make man after our likeness and in our image. So we look at the, the divine reflection and aspiration. When we look at um, the 82nd division of Psalms verse six, here we want to expand on our elevated status. You are gods. You are all sons of the most high. Even though this is a somewhat of a poetic hyperbole, it emphasizes the profound potential and responsibility that is bestowed upon each of us as human beings. It challenges us to recognize our roles as bearers of divine light and agents of justice. And it suggests that our life's purpose is deeply rooted in mirroring divine qualities and aspiring towards the spiritual excellence that is available to us. It tells us that we have profound potential, that we are greater than we've been showing up and than we've been told we have the, the capacity to be. It challenges our current belief when we say that we are God. Many of us are very uncomfortable with saying we are God or hearing someone say, I am God. Now, when, when someone says that they are God, first, first of all, let us understand that what they're really saying, that they are an aspect of God, that they are source, walking, talking, and breathing. When I see you, I see an aspect of, of source. When I see creation, when I see a, a bird, a bee, when I see a tree, when I see flowers, uh, when I see the raindrop, when I feel the wind, uh, when I look at nature, I see aspects of source, of its creation. When I see you and I, when I see a human being, I see potential. The probably, problem is they're humans being. Very few of us have um, really grasped what it means to be a divine spiritual being. We have a head knowledge of it, but we don't have a hard knowledge of it. We don't really know it. And when you know something, you show it. But because we have a head knowledge, we will ascribe to the idea, we'll, we, we will uh, mentalize it, but very few of us are really actualizing. So we must take some time and reflect on this divine idea and even come to the place of as aspiring to be a divine or to actualize, to move through life as a divine spiritual being. For whether you are expressing as it or not, you have the capacity, you have the potential to be a divine spiritual being. It's lying dormant. Um, maybe there's a disconnect and hopefully you'll get the hookup through the course of this teaching. So it, it, it's, it's about covenant and intimacy. When we look at the prophet Jeremiah um, in Jeremiah 31 and 33, he presents a revolutionary idea, a radical idea with a new covenant, which focuses not on an external adherence to a law like living according to the Ten Commandments or living according to the, um, the uh, 42 um, laws of Ma'at, uh, but an internal transformation. So we must move from having a, a mental nature to our spiritual nature. And we see it here where the scripture says, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. Okay. And when we talk about the mind here, we're talking about the spirit. This covenant highlights a shift that is to take place from a transactional to a relational dynamic. You know, when we look at the Old Testament, uh, when we look at, for most of us, when we look at religion, it's transactional, what we must do versus what we must be. Uh, when we look at the, this new creation, it's more relational, who I am in alignment with source, okay? So this covenant highlights a shift from transactional to relational dynamic with 
the divine with the creator, emphasizing personal and communal intimacy with God to be in alignment with, to be in attunement with. It shouldn't be something that you bounce in and out of. Like when you go into prayer, you go into a connection. It shouldn't be that kind of way. It should be that you walk in the spirit, you align with the spirit, that when somebody see you, they see the essence of source. Come on now, because whether you know it or not, however you're showing up right now, you are showing up God as God in its greatest form, or God in this, or creator in this weakest form through you. Because the spirit of source dwells within you to, to actualize on the high end of the vibrational scale of frequency. You must move from being body ruled or emotionally ruled or mentally ruled, and that those three be subject to your true essence as a spiritual being. So when we look at this scripture, Jeremiah 31 and 3, it suggests a direct and unmediated access to divine wisdom and guidance. It fosters a deep heart level engagement with spiritual truths. You now understand that you have a silent partner. You have the divine essence in you. You don't have to look outside of you for clarity and for direction. And you don't have to have a mediator or a go-between. But religion has established the necessity of a mediator, even the necessity of Jesus, uh, where Jesus is not a mediator. Jesus, when you understand the story of Jesus coming, is a, it was about an individual exemplifying what happens when you align with the idea that you're created in his image after its likeness and that you are aligned with it. Okay, it's no longer transactional. It's about I'm in a relationship with source. And this was the original intent of man. Man was created in his image after his likeness. Man was breathed into, given the propensity to have dominion over the land, over his world. Now, dominion does not extend beyond you. You have dominion over your life. Your life is a reflection. The world in which you live is a reflection of your beliefs held and your thoughts that you continually think. So if you don't like the life that you're living, then you have to change the way you're thinking, the thoughts you think, and you got to get at the root of the beliefs that substantiate that thought pattern. And now that's a very difficult thing. But until you're willing to do some belief system clarification work, you're going to continue to get what you've been getting. And we want to really move away from that. We must develop a, a level of intimacy, understanding that uh, it's not the words we read in a book, it's not the things we think in our from our reasoning capacity, it's the things of our heart that should be controlling us in that they're written on our hearts. And, and that is the essence or where source operates from. It doesn't operate from your head. It operates through your heart. That's important. When we look at the New Testament messengers, or messenger in particular, um, we look at messengers such as Jesus. We look at messengers such as Paul um, and the other disciples. Um, but even in John, we find here's a message. Um, we see John 14 and 20 tells us, I am in the Father and you are in me, and I am in you. Here we find that Jesus profoundly expands on the theme here of John 14 and 20, revealing the intimate relationship within this Trinity and extending this unity to each of us. I am in the Father, or I am in source, and you are in me. Now we know we can't practically be in Jesus as a human being. Um, we can't be in, we can't share, two things cannot occupy the same space, but it's implying a thought here that we are divine spiritual beings aligned with source. And for those who follow Christianity, aligned with the messenger Jesus, so you're one with his message, and that because you're one with its message, its message is one with you. That's why you can say things like, if you've seen the sun, 
you've seen the Father. He said, the scripture tells us that Christ did not count it as robbery, and you have to get to the place too where you don't count it as robbery or taking something away from source to consider yourself equal. Now, equal does not mean same, but it means um, created from the same, from the essence of. He did not consider it robbery to consider himself equal with source. And so you must, if you say, I am the father, I won, then you should not consider it robbery or you're taking down or taking away from source by aligning with source. Now, now there may be a conflict if you are aligning with source, but not showing up with, with the power and the glory and the uh, propensities of source, then you are saying something, but doing nothing. So we have to make, there's no differentiation between me and God other than I am a, uh, I have the spirit of source in me with measure. The scripture tells us that every man is given a measure, okay? And we talk about faith and we talk about this faith is spirit in action. So there's no differentiation. So uh, we know that God is neither male nor female, nor Jew, nor Greek, nor Hebrew, nor Aramaic, nor Islamic. God is a source, is a spirit. And that's why I like to use the term source, okay? So then we also have to know that it's not just a mental idea. For too many people, um, they just have a head knowledge of this information, um, but they have not taken beyond taken it beyond b being just an idea. Uh, I'm talking about actualizing it. I'm talking about your walk and your talk correlate, they correspond. So. This transformation that we're talking about is a transformation through beholding, okay, God. So when you look at 2 Corinthians, this is a good scripture. It's really talking about a, an alignment, a conscious alignment. In this particular scripture, we see that Paul is capturing the dynamic and ongoing nature of spiritual transformation, okay? When he says, we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into its image with every increasing glory. So this verse speaks to the process of what we would like to call sanctification. Um, and when I say sanctification, I'm not talking about uh, uh, don't smoke, don't drink, don't, don't the, the, the don't, the, the, the 10 don'ts, but I'm talking about aligning with the vibrational frequency of creation through a continuous engagement and identification with your divine nature. I am divine. To go throughout the day and say, I am divine. And to ask yourself throughout the day, am I expressing divinely? Or am I, am I really walking as a mere human being? Am I subjecting myself to what humans subject themselves? Or do I hold on to the possibility of a divine idea? Like what the word says, if I'm sick, do I say I'm strong? If I mean, I'm, I'm healed. If I'm sick, do I say I'm healed? If I'm weak, do I say I'm strong? If I'm broke, busted, and disgusted, do I say that I'm the head and not the tail? What is your confession? Your confession tells you whether or not you're walking as a mere human being or as a divine spiritual being. So uh, it's, 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 transformation is a point of gradual unfolding. Life, it's a lifelong journey of becoming more like the divine or uh, no, not like, but operating as the divine. Like says that I'm not it but it says I'm not a genuine copy of it, but as it. So I want you to uh, expand into the uh, more of it, you know, align to, with the divine through contemplation, through um, the way you worship. And worship is not going somewhere, getting on your knees or lifting your hands. But example, a bird worships through flying. That is, you are... Uh, expressing fully as your divine, um, as your design. Okay, that's the worship. And obedience, uh, reflecting a deeper reality of your spiritual 
metamorphosis. That is, you are unfolding. So I want you to, to be aware that alignment comes through a continuous awareness that I am God, that I and source are one. I am one with source. I was in the beginning with creation. It was a deliberate and intentional creation. Creation uh, provided all that I needed. For man was not created until after all that was needed was created. And then it was created and put into an environment that was friendly towards it, an environment that supported it. And so we must understand we have the capacity to express through life in an environment that is conducive to joy. But now you're going to have challenges in life. Why are you going to have challenges? Because challenges brings growth. Uh, when we have a challenge, when we have disparities in our life, all of these things give us the opportunity to actualize, to uh, put on our Superman's cape, to go into the phone booth and come out and solve the problem that is showing up in our lives. That's important. Now, many of us, the only story we know is the story that we've been told, the story we've been sold on. That is the Abrahamic, the, uh, the King James version of the Bible and the Genesis story of creation. There is a story of creation that predates the Abrahamic creation story. There is a story that is foundational um, to the Abraham creation story. It's called the Memphite theology. The Memphite theology provides a parallel narrative about the ancient comedic spiritual system where the creator that is called Ptah, and Ptah looks like the image of our Oscar. And that's interesting that the Oscar represents an award that is given to an actor that is able to be is creative in his expression. Uh, and this image is the same image as the comedic image uh, known as Ta or what is a uh, netter. Another word for netter is what the English or what the Westerners call God. So here in the Abraham fashion, we have God depicted as through the word God, or you may go back and use some, he, um, you may call him um, Jehovah uh, or Yahweh, uh, you know, but the, it's saying these, there was a, a netter known as Pata, who, who was the God of creation, um, and that it used thought and speech to manifest the cosmos and the pantheon of netters and that netterus that made up um, the the Memphite theology. I have given you a uh, a link, and I'll put it in this 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 uh, playback, so you can see, understand what I'm talking about. For many of you, this is new information. But when we look at the Memphite theology, it emphasizes the power of the divine word and thought, akin to what the, what we in Christianity call logos, the concept. Um, of the spoken word, uh, suggesting a universe that is created and sustained by a coherent, intelligent, purposeful, divine will. When we understand the, the, the Memphite theology, we come to the understand that it offers a view of unified divine essence manifesting in diverse forms, resonating with the biblical portrayal of source or God's creative word in Genesis. Now, that's important that you know, because this idea that we have of the creative thought, the creative word is not really expanded upon um, in its entirety when you study um, traditional Western Christianity. But when you begin to expand beyond that, uh, even with the, like the new thought, a lot of what our religion gives us is a head base, it's a, a fallen nature understanding of source. But the word tells us that the natural man cannot comprehend, cannot even see the things of source. And so um, many of us, we get caught up in this natural attempt to define and explain God, um, and then go through the things of religion to be connected with God, and we come up short. 
But we come to the realization that all we need to do is to be reconnected to source. That your what reconnecting means the moment you realign with the idea and begin to hold that alignment and begin to um, 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 uh, unfold, allow it to strengthen and unfold, you're going to see that it, life takes on a whole new meaning. So when we look at this theology, it emphasizes the power of the divine word, so forth and so on, and it predates the Abraham creation story. Now, I wanted just to introduce that because when you understand that, you will see that man was never just an after afterthought. Um, man, matter of fact, man is is premier in creation. For we are all creating, create creative beings. We are creating today. The world in which you currently live in, your world, how it's expressing, you are the primary actor that created it. You are playing the role. You have brought into fruition the perfect um, situations to play that role. If you are playing the role of one who is barely getting by, you have brought the perfect conditions in that you can express as one who is sick, one who is diseased, one who is poor and walking in poverty. Now, that may sound a, a, a little bit too much because it says you are responsible for, for the most part, 90% of the world in which you have created, you are responsible for it. But because we are not in the world alone, we bump up against individuals, we allow individuals to make cameo appearances in our life, and we allow their problems, their challenge to become our problems. And so we have other stuff we're dealing with that are not even our stuff. Um, but we can take control of that when you begin to take, um, take on the position that you are a divine spiritual being, that you have been infused with the ability to handle any situation or circumstance that comes your way. Understanding that you don't walk according to what you see. You don't allow what is lying out beyond your two eyes to dictate what you have or will continue to have. All the things that are showing up should just be a reflection for you, whether or not you've creating what you desire or what you don't. If something is reflected in your life, and is not desirable, the desire that comes from there is the motivation for you to change it. You don't have to go through it. You don't have to continue to cultivate it. You grow through the things you go through. When I have an experience that is not um, the ideal experience, I ask myself, where did it come from? What role did I play in ushering it into my life? What lesson do I learn? Or if it is, is this thing playing out in my life, not because I have a lesson to learn, but because those who individuals who are around me can see how to handle this situation. So you gotta take some time. Don't so quickly try to get out of what you're, what you're in. Grow through the things that you're going through. Now, um, it, it, so that, that's really important that we understand that there is a theology that goes beyond what we've been given. Now, implications of having a creator complex. Now, I want this is really what I wanted to get at this morning, that if we were created in the image after this likeness, if we were there in the beginning, we are not an afterthought. We have the propensity to create the world in which we desire to live in. There are some implications. There are some things that come with taking on a creator complex, okay, as a divine spiritual being. One, you have an enhanced sense of identity and self-worth by understanding your oneself as made in the image of the divine. You, you experience a profound enhancement of self-worth and identity. You recognizing a shared nature with source, the divine, can inspire you to a greater respect for yourself and for others, okay, as bearers of this divine image, encouraging behaviors and attitude that reflect the elevated understanding, the expanded understanding. So we have an enhanced sense of identity. I am not the I of me, but I am the I am of me. Come on now. 
The I is the, for many of us, when we define our I-ness, we define our physical bodies, we define our phenotype, we, we, we define our, our careers, uh, the things that we do, but we don't really define ourselves as divine spiritual beings as, as one with source. But we got to begin to do that. Uh, secondly, we have a deepened spiritual connection. When you begin to understand that you are a creator, it, you begin to embrace a divine oneness, which leads to a deeper, more personal connection with source. This relationship uh, can manifest through increased spiritual practices such as prayer. Now, it's not even a prayer of asking, but it's a time of aligning of conversation, meditation that's being still and knowing that you are God and contemplation. So you're just being still. And sometimes you're going to be still and know. And sometimes you're going to be still, know, and, and contemplate. It fosters a sense of peace, guidance, purpose derived from continuous dialogue and divine connection. So we have to we have to keep that connection. We have we we can't be disconnected. Um, we have to be connected. An example of the disconnect would be when you look at the story of Jesus when he was supposedly hung on the cross and when he hung his head and died. You heard him before he died. You heard him say uh, a statement that said, "My God, My God, why hast thou forsaken me?" Because at that point in his realization. It had never been disconnected from source. So it's like he was, he lost the power and it was a place he had never been. And so many of us have never really walked in the power that having no power is the place of normalcy. But I come by to say today that there's a hookup that's being made. The ability for you to move from operating in 3G or 5G to now having a Wi-Fi. And that Wi-Fi is when source breathed on you. It breathed into you and man became a living soul. But because of the over uh, identification with this natural realm, our spirit being is held hostage to what it sees. It held hostage to the sensory realm. Is held hostage to to the um, the emotional self. Is held hostage to our physical bodies. But we have to um, no longer conform to those things. We are to be transformed by the renewing, the reconnecting of our spirit to spirit. And we have to understand that. Uh, another implication is there's a transformation of values and ethics with the recognition of your divine essence that's within you and others around you there may be a significant shift there will be a significant shift in your values and your ethical considerations it's not that thou shall not do's but it will become the i will not it will be the convictions from the things that are written in your heart versus the things that are in your head it leads to more compassion, uh, more altruism, you know, giving and caring, ethical lifestyles. You cannot mandate ethics. Come on now. It has to come from within. Another thing that happens, you have a community and relationship. As individuals embrace their identity as part of the divine whole, there becomes a, not only a oneness of being with source, but I understand that I am my brother's keeper. This realization transform your interpersonal relationships and the community dynamics, okay? You can't live on one side of town and see that others on the other sides of town are living drastically different and not have compassion for them. And if it's in your power to do something about it, there's a sense of connectedness uh, that encourage a more collaboration and support amongst one another. And then there's a, a major implication and that has to do with our mental, that is our, our, our brain faculty and our emotional, our physical, spiritual well-being. When you really learn to understand your divine makeup and your divine makeup is not just your spiritual makeup, but the entirety of your makeup, your, your brain. Uh, when you understand the brain and its complexities and you can see how the brain in and of itself is such a powerful um, 
um, um, organism or an organ and that it, it has the capacity to have recall, to hold on to information. You can go to the file cabinet of your brain and if you have a situation that you've been through in the past, you can kind of deduce so how to do move through that. But we're not called to live in solely in dependency on our brains. We must come to the realization that man is a spirit. He possesses a brain or a soul. He lives in a body, but we are not our bodies. We're not our emotional selves. We're not our mental selves, but we are a divine spiritual being that pulls it all together. That's important. And lastly, you come away with a sense of purpose and direction. That when you understand that your life is a reflection of your divine purpose, you, may, you begin to feel a renewed sense of direction. Okay, and what comes forth from this understanding is a level of motivation to seek and fulfill your unique vocation or your unique calling. That's really important. Um, and it has social impacts. There's so many other implications that come with taking on a creator's complex. And I, I mean, I'm encouraging each of you to consider that. So this morning, we've kind of kind of stepped on creation, divine reflections, um, the covenant that we must have, an intimacy that must be found there. We looked a little bit at Christ's consciousness, transformation through being continually in alignment with the, the idea that you are one with the Father, you are one with Source, even expanded beyond what you have been given to understand where you need to go to. Sometimes what you've been given is limiting. Um, so I'm you to consider um, become familiar with the Memphite theology and where we get most of the tenets of Christianity today and then the implications that comes with taking on a creator's identity well again you are not an afterthought you are a, you are God's crowning thought you are the uh, you created yourself in the in your image of your true self as a divine spiritual being. And that's so key to all of us. Well, we're gonna open up the floor for um, some dialogue. Uh, but before I do that, I want to give those of you who um, participate each week and those who have participated today the opportunity to, to participate in the law of circulation. Um, so I want you, in taking your imaginary um, hand in your, in your mind, a, a seed that you would like to sow. And I want you to repeat after me this morning. I am a generous and joyful giver, sharing my blessings with the world as I give freely and abundantly to this ministry. I attract even more abundance and prosperity into my life. I trust that the universe source is infinitely abundant and that there's always enough to give and receive. With ease and gratitude, I am grateful for the opportunity to give and to receive, and for the blessings that flow to me, through me, and as me. Circulate, circulate, circulate. So I thank those of you, if you desire to be a blessing this morning, you can give by way of the cash app or the, um, you can use also Zelle. And the number you wanna use is 708-368-1076. Again, 708-368-1076. That's if you wanna give online. I thank those of you who are participating. Also, I wanna remind you that every morning, Monday through Friday, you got a care or a concern. Join us for 15 minutes of prayer and meditation. It's daily, Monday through Friday, 6 to 6.15. Sometimes we go beyond that, but when we go beyond that, um, you don't have to stick around because the essence of the meditation has been given. And we, we go beyond because of the testimonies, the sharing, um, the people talking about how it works because they worked it. So I encourage you, the dial-in number, you can write it down, 518-318-7801. You don't have to say anything. Just join us and participate in that. Lastly, I want to welcome each of you this morning to this to the not only this um, 
Oasis Spiritual Center, which is our online platform. But if you're in the St. Louis area, we have the St. Louis New Thought Center. Um, if you're in the Chicagoland area, we have the Chicagoland New Thought area. We have the Atlanta New Thought area. Um, many of these um, ministries are lying dormant. We've built it and we're just waiting on you. Um, so it's a community, community of commitment. That is, we have a commitment to unlocking your potential, fostering your personal growth and process in every area of your life. We operate with integrity. We are dedicated to guiding individuals such as yourself on paths of personal discovery and mastery, empowering you to live your best life. We meet you where you are. You don't have to change. You don't have to do anything that you don't want to do. And lastly, we offer solutions, not just solutions from the head, but distinctive soul paths requiring your distinctive soul path requires a personalized solution to unleash your potential. So join us at one of our monthly gatherings in one of the cities or a city near you that's coming and we build a community of like-minded thinkers committed to changing the world in which we live. Okay, you wanna find out more, you can scan that QR code. Awesome, awesome. So I hope something was said and that was uplifting and encouraging. Um, so what I wanna do, we have a few minutes here uh, for those of you who are with me, if you have an aha moment, something you came away with this morning and you want to share it, um, take a moment and go ahead and um, type it in the chat if you're on YouTube. But if you're in the um, Zoom room this morning, go ahead and raise your hand or go ahead and type it in. Let me see what I got here. We had individuals joining us uh, from Illinois, Mississippi, uh, Atlanta. Uh, we had uh, individuals in Arkansas this morning, um, everything, well, well, I'm glad you guys joined us this morning. Um, somebody says, how is the image, oh no, I asked how was my image showing up, so they said it showed up good. Let me see if there's any other comments here. So I don't see any comments there, uh, I don't see any hands raised, um, so I, I said we'll take that as I've laid it out um, succinctly and clearly. Uh, but again, I enjoy the opportunity to engage you. The thing that is um, disheartening about presenting in this platform, there's no two-way engagement oftentimes. And so if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand. Oh, thank you. I see you, Rachel. You, um, um, thank you, Rachel. You have the mic. Let me see here. Uh, I, I just had to unmute yourself. There you go. You hear me? Yes, ma'am. You kind of muffled in the back. Let's try it again. Okay, let me. I think my phone is still on. Hold on. Okay, I can hear you now. Okay, I was asking. Um, am I still muffled? No, you you sound good. Um, now my my takeaway is when you said dominion does not. It means that we have control over our world and our situation. And equal with source is equal in essence. That was a good takeaway for me. But I, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. But one question I want to ask was when you, when you, I think it was last week you talked about the, about the fall. It, there was a descent from the spiritual to the natural that's correct uh, physical okay um we were taught and i i'm sure er erroneously that the the descent was source was angry with us that we had done something wrong and that's why we ended up in the state that we were in okay okay so good let me let me say them first of all source has full control over its emotional self um as a parent just let's just make it natural when you have a child let's say an infant that is growing and a child does something contrary to what you have um, requested that it do oftentimes you don't become emotionally charged you, you you look at the situation you see sometimes because they were disobedient they are getting the results of that disobedient 
and you come alongside of them and you bring more clarity. Like if don't touch that hot stove, they touch the hot stove, they get a blister, you take care of the blister, you're disappointed, but you know that this is part of the learning process. So when we go back to the Genesis story, the Genesis story says, um, uh, he put them in the garden and he said that you can eat of any tree that uh, you can make you freely eat of. But I'm going to tell you, the day you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. And so when he ate of the tree, uh, make the story short, uh, he came looking for, uh, source came looking for man. And um, he didn't really have to look, a source knows always where you are. But it, in this story, it gives us the idea that man had hid himself because the day he ate of that tree, um, that he began to, to eat of does not imply a one-time thing, but begin to consume that, that, and it begins to consume him. The more we are aligned with the natural world, the more it's consuming to us. Um, we love it. Like most of us don't want to die because we're consumed with life as we know it. But if we really realize that we go back to a place from which we come, which is better than this place, then we wouldn't have a problem with that. But the natural man does not um, really care for the things of the spirit realm because it delves, lives inside of what it can see, taste, feel, hear, touch. And as a result, when they ate of the tree, they begin to live a lifestyle of walking in the natural versus walking in the spirit. And the way the story is written, it gives you the impression that this all happened in a day this could have happened over a period of hundreds of hundreds of years thousands of years till ultimately there was a disconnection meaning they lost connection but the connection was still there but it was so poor and so the disconnect i don't like to say it was the fall of man but it was the ultimate disconnection of man by descending from being a divine spiritual being to over identifying with being a natural being that is either being mentally ruled, physically ruled or emotionally ruled. OK, and then we have to begin to deal with the Old Testament, the way it was written. It made God and mean angry God. And that was part of the control mechanism to uh, make you come into alignment. And, you know, if you got a parent that's mean and angry, it produces a level of fear and trembling. And you, you know, you don't want to make a mistake. You don't want, you know, that you're going to be punished and you're going to be judged. But that's not the true spirit of source. And that's part of what we have to step away from. Did that help? Yes, sir. Thank you. Awesome. Well, good morning. How's the weather down there in Mississippi? It's good. good. Excellent. Good, good. Thank you. Keep coming back. Okay. Good morning, Carolyn. Uh, oh, we have another person from Mississippi this morning. Carolyn, you have the mic. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, Carolyn, I see your hand is up there. I'm going to, yeah, go ahead. You're still muted. Let me see. If... Okay, so maybe um, she stepped away. Um, let's see if I got anything else here. Uh, any other comments or questions? I don't see any other comments or questions. Um, over on the YouTube side, so um, Carl said, great teaching. Uh, King say, hi, Auntie Rachel. So whoever's out there, uh, uh, Rachel, your King T is in the, the YouTube uh, family this morning. Carl says, I like what you said. Let us make man in our image. And we were all present there at that time. Yes. I like when you said faith is a spirit, is spiritual in action. It's a, right, because it says faith without works is dead. And if you are not exercising your faith, then guess what? You are not walking in the spiritual realm. And we, we must get to that. And I want to encourage everybody to begin to work, work towards walking in the spirit and not the flesh. I'm going to try one more time. Go out with that this morning. All right. You guys have a